Hello and welcome to Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. I'm Gay Maxwell and I'm the manager of the Office of Continuing Education at the Brattleboro Retreat. The retreat puts on about 30 full day conferences for mental health professionals from all over New England. They come to hear experts in the fields of addiction uh, treatment and also behavioral health. Uh, these uh, experts come and teach mental health professionals new skills, new strategies, new insights, which they in turn can take back to their practice. I have here today, and I'm thrilled to have him here, Kevin Gallagher, who hails uh, from Burlington, Vermont, and he has a private practice in Burlington called Optima. He is one of those experts that we invite to come down and make presentations. And today he made a presentation called Caught in the Adolescent Vortex, how to help parents and families manage the most turbulent of transitions. And today he's gonna to talk with us about parenting the adolescent. So I wanna thank you, Kevin, for coming and welcome. joining us. You're very welcome. So parents hear a lot about these days in the media and so forth. Uh, the teenage brain and mm -hmm. the, the um, what's the, I, I even wrote it down, the prefrontal cortex. Explain about the prefrontal yeah. cortex and what the, what, the, what the buzz is about this. Yes. Well, I don't think I would have put a prefrontal cortex in in the mid-20s. And this is when this front part of your brain, this is what we're talking about, this front part right here mm -hmm. is the prefrontal cortex. And it's the executive function. It's sort of the CEO or the president of the brain. Mm -hmm. And to have that, com I mean, what company would wait 25 <laughs> years to hire a president to run it? You know, so I think everyone should have been born as a brain and then your toes come later and you'll, you'll figure out what to do before then. Yes. You know, so I think this is what makes teenage and the, and the 20s, the early 20s so scary for parents is because they don't really experience their kids as seeming to think very well. You know, uh, statements like, what were you thinking? How could you possibly, you know, and it's like, well, that's kind of their brain. Mm -hmm. So this front part is responsible for impulse control, problem solving, uh, decision making, values, rules, and norms, and verbal expression of emotional content. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the list of what I hear parents nervous or anxious or frustrated with their teens and 20-somethings. Mm -hmm. It's usually one or a bunch of those that they don't think, they don't think soon enough because it feels good, they do it. They question everything, you know, sort of like, you know, if pot is a plant, then it shouldn't be illegal. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're questioning <laughs> values, rules, and norms, you know, and it's like, okay, well, it is. So that's what you have to work with. Even if you don't think it is, it is. And then verbal expression of emotional content. Think of how many times you've heard or yourself have tried to talk to a teenager and you're interested, like you're concerned about something, so you ask them questions and they say, I don't know, or I don't want to talk about it, or it's none of your business. And what do we do? We keep plying them with more questions. Well, is it this? Was it something that happened at school? Was it? And we just won't leave them alone. Well, they know how they feel and they know how they think, but getting it here is really hard mm -hmm. and they don't want to look or seem like they're not on your level so here we are kind of spitting stuff out left and right and they're sitting there thinking i can't do this uh -huh. you know so you'll get some sort of pushback or some deflection mm -hmm. you know this is ridiculous or you don't know what you're talking about or why are you making me sit here and talk to you and it's not meant to be cruel or anything it's just sort of i'm losing i'm losing face here. I'm looking like somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and it's because I can't really explain how I'm feeling mm -hmm. or what I'm thinking. So if you sort of imagine that that's what's going on in the prefrontal cortex and it grows in bits and pieces, mm -hmm. you know, your whole life, and uh, the other fast time it grows is uh, in infancy and then this is another big fast time um, that, you know, less questions, more waiting, um, 
not not being disinterested in communication, but um, but don't exercise your communication muscle, you know, too much. Too much. Too much. So you're saying that the prefrontal cortex, that's really not fully formed until you're until 20... 23, 25. 25. I've 20. seen it as high as 26, some people sort of say. Mm -hmm. I think that's somewhat culture-bound. Like, I'm not quite sure, say, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where um, teenagers might be married and already have kids by 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. I think probably there's a increased yes. growth uh -huh. there, because mm -hmm. just about the massive amounts of responsibility. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know if the decision-making is as good, mm -hmm. you know, but certainly the acceptance of more adult things compared to our culture um, are probably happening. But our culture, like mid-20s, and you know, if you talk to people in their late 20s, you know, they will sort of say, like, I just feel like so much smarter and I feel like so much more capable and I, I, I handle things better mm -hmm. and, you know, but, you know, you don't always hear that from a 20-year-old. Yes. You know, yes. they're still going, ugh, ugh, <laughs> you know, about things. So, Kevin, one of the other things I wanted to ask you, um, you know I have two, as they call them, emerging adults myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What uh, are the challenges that you feel that um, adolescents face in 2013 mm -hmm. that you and I would have never dreamed of facing? And, mm -hmm. and you know, they have significant challenges that I, I don't think that we had to grapple with. No. No. And certainly drugs and alcohol would be one of them. And mm -hmm. those things were there too, but it was a very different scene. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you just sort of take uh, marijuana, um, like the, the potency of today's marijuana is very different than in the 50s, 60s, and 70s mm -hmm. um, uh, with much fewer uh, people doing it then. So I think that's certainly one of them. I think um, uh, divorced families and blended families mm -hmm. uh, is very different. When I was in high school, I went to a Catholic high school, but out of 450 kids in the school, I w had the only divorced parents. Mm. Uh, that would be unheard of now. If you had 450 kids, you would see a large number of kids from divorced families. Um, I think uh, dual working parents um, I think that's always been uh, part of the case, but I think it's even more prevalent now. So you add that plus single parenting, um, it makes it much more challenging. Um, and probably one of the biggest things I would say is technology. Um, I don't know if you remember, because uh, you're much younger than I am, but huh. um, <laughs> watching snow on TV, like oh, waiting absolutely. for the TV to come on, because yes. like no shows started until 8 a.m. So you turn it on at quarter of eight, and there would just be snow on the screen. Shh. There was Mar Modern fa Farmer, though. That came on. That came on. And yes. sometimes you'd get the yes. whatever that was. Or the flag that would fly. Or the flag. The flag. Although that was usually at night. So yes. we're really dating ourselves yes. here. Yeah. But sort of like, you know, <laughs> the idea that TV actually was sometimes working and sometimes wasn't. And not the TV. It was like there was nothing being aired. Right. So now 600 channels airing 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. and then you have Hulu and, and Xbox and laptops and PDAs. Um, that's sort of like Phones. you can, right, right, you can yeah. watch yeah. TV on everything. So I think, I think the amount of stimulation uh, that kids face is a little overwhelming mm -hmm. for brains that aren't quite up to par yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think social media is incredibly challenging at this time. Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, Pinterest, Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different platforms for people to talk. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not quite sure if the talking is that useful. Um, you know, it just seems like a lot of connection without being connected. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, cyberbullying. You know, sort of like if someone was cyberbullying me, I wouldn't get online. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't go to my Facebook page. They can't cyberbully me, me if I'm doing my homework online. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm on a social media platform. So I'm not suggesting that, you know, kids that are being cyberbullied shouldn't have an online presence. But sort of like to remind kids that sort of like nothing is happening to them in, in a way that they can't stop parts of it. Mm -hmm. But not all of but it. But not all of it, you know. And I think we just have to understand more about sort of the 
cowardness quality of cyberbullying. I mean, it used to be hard enough to just have a bully in your school, but now you can have so many bullies that, you know, just do it without ever having to talk to you. Right, and um, that don't even know you. And don't even know you, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what are, how are you seeing that manifest in, in, in your work? I mean, wh or, or how are you needing to help kids with the, the social media, with um, technology? Yeah. Uh, certainly the social media is to continue to encourage real, live, in-person relationships. Mm. Um, this is the same for the gaming crowd too. Uh, gaming is much more, assured, um, online gaming is much more popular with boys uh, that I see. Uh, but they play with their friends, you know, that they call their friends. And there'll be like 20 of them all trying to take down some sort of evil empire. And they are working as a collective. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I don't think these people are friends, especially if you've never even seen them. So I do a lot of encouraging of, can you meet some of the people who are your friends online, as opposed to only talking online? Mm -hmm. um, can you use the phone? I mean, it's amazing that the phone doesn't get used. Like, these devices are phones, but they look like typewriters. We actually have gone back to Morse code, mm -hmm. you know, even though we have the telephone, uh, that we're going to send messages this way. Voicemail is just... It's, it's so um, passe. It's ancient like faxing. Yes. You know, it's sort of like, why would I fax, you know? Um, it's like, I don't know. Um, so, you know, I think kind of the speed at which things happen that I, I tend to want to help teenagers get as much awkward, uncomfortable people time mm -hmm. given they will hunger for that later in life. That we do want love, we do want companionship, we do like community and family. And if you've been mostly talking to people on social media, you're not going to be very good at that. Mm -hmm. How you're true. Not be, yeah. Yes. Well, um, I also wanted to ask you about uh, the challenges of hormones, mm -hmm. and and maybe I'm I'm going backwards a little bit here, but but when is it hormones, and when does is that maybe a, a parental excuse for not getting the help you need for your kid? Yeah, and that's a huge concern for parents. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, you know, and not a day goes by that some parent doesn't sort of say, "Is this normal? Is this a phase? Should we be doing something about this?" It seems bad, but maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of guesswork. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of guesswork. Um, I guess I, I would, I would tend to err on the side of phase. I don't think we need to be diagnosing kids with all kinds of terrible problems early. Um, but I also would want to understand more from uh, my teenager sort of what is exacerbating or contributing to the complaints mm -hmm. that they're having. You know, do, are they online too much and therefore are too plugged in mm -hmm. and, and need you know, time off of devices. Are they not getting enough sleep? Are they not getting enough sleep? You know, because you can talk all night. Um, you know, so I would pay. I would be paying a lot of attention to sort of what is contributing to this. But the other thing is, um, I sort of have like a, a, a three strikes you're out kind of idea. That so something happens that seems a little out of character. Um, do you need to jump on it right away? I mean, parents do have to pick their battles mm -hmm. in terms of what they're seeing. You know, I don't know if a kid getting in trouble once for something is a kid that's going off the deep end. But sort of like if you parents can keep track of sort of like how much of this is like this and like this and like this. Mm -hmm. If your son or daughter used to have a lot of sleepovers or go to a lot of sleepovers and now fewer and fewer and fewer, sort of how come? Mm -hmm. um, if there's a lot more pushback in the morning in terms of getting up and getting ready, I would be wondering about the night before and what's going on, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily jump on it right away, but I just would pay attention to it. So I think I would look for more themes or trends mm -hmm. as opposed to immediately going to this is social anxiety, this is depression, this is ADHD. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how anyone in the world doesn't have ADHD with this amount of stimulation. Absolutely. I mean, there's just so much to pay, uh, to watch. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when people tell me, you know, son or daughter is, uh, probably has ADD, you know, I want to look at school records back to kindergarten. Because mm -hmm. you should be able to see it in the record. 
Mm -hmm. You know, start strong, continues to go downhill, mm -hmm. or starts then up, then down, then up, then down. Like you don't get ADD. Sudden onset no. ADD. No, yeah. Yeah, that could be hormones. Yeah, that could be, that could be hormones. hormones. It's sort of like, oh, I've discovered girls, or I've discovered boys, and sort of like, yes, that's not ADD. What are red flags to you? I mean, what, what, what red flags should parents be looking for in, in this developmental stage? That's a good question. Certainly increased aggression, uh, which is hard. I'm going to say that, but it's hard because testosterone levels in adolescent boys just make them prone to being mouthier. Mm -hmm. uh, they get madder. They get in your face. I have lots of moms that I talk to that are really afraid that their son's going to like hit them. Mm -hmm. Then I talk to those boys and they're like, hit my mother? I would never hit my mother. Like, what's wrong with her? You know, but she's 5'2", he's 6 feet. He's red-faced, angry, and in her face. Mm -hmm. you know, she's not so sure. He doesn't look yeah. like a man in control. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I would look for aggression. Uh, I would also look um, for disinterest. Mm -hmm. You know, you used to like such and such so much. You know, is, did you just outgrow it or sort of, what, you know, kind of what's different? Uh, more secretive. But I don't know if having a journal is being more secretive because it's pretty common for mm -hmm. kids to keep journals starting in high school mm -hmm. uh, as a way to sort of dump out intense feelings that they have. Um, fragility, mm -hmm. you know, like meltdowns over things that seem kind of slight. And again, I wouldn't pay much attention to it, but sort of many of them, mm -hmm. I'd sort of say, you know, the last couple of weeks, like you just seem to like fall apart anytime I ask you to help me with, you know, dinner like what's like what's the problem mm -hmm. you know because it seems it doesn't match mm -hmm. the situation right little like you know um you know i was in a grocery store the other day and this woman was very angry at the cashier about lettuce and screaming with the head of lettuce in her hand and so when i it was my turn i said i said oh i said sorry and she's like yes that woman was so mad at me and i said that woman was having a bad day before she got here. Mm -hmm. I said, no one can get that mad about lettuce. <laughs> like, this is something else. This is something else. Yeah. And so it's that kind of feeling that, you know, yes, kids get mad when you tell them you can't do things even though they want to. But sort of like if they, like, try to kill themselves mm -hmm. or say they're going to kill themselves, mm -hmm. that's like, okay, that's not really... You know, it could be a response to try to get their way, but it's a little excessive if the thing they wanted was like to eat more of their candy from their Halloween bag. Mm -hmm. Like it's too big. It's too big so you need to yeah. pay attention. But what's hard for parents to pay attention to around those kinds of things is that, uh, <laughs> is that they get used to their son or daughter mm -hmm. so they don't really notice it as that different. Mm -hmm. You I know, see. she's always been like that. And sort of like, well, right, but you have to pay attention differently in the teen years because you'd be looking for more responsibility, more insight, mm -hmm. um, more ability to handle complex situations. Mm -hmm. And if they're still functioning like in fourth grade yes. around those things, then that's something to pay attention to. Yes. We're going to have to wrap it up pretty soon. Okay. But what I wanted to ask you is, um, it's personal for me, um, <laughs> when, does, uh, um, when do parents become less embarrassing. I mean, when do we, are we regarded with, do we ever get our dignity back after adolescence, uh, after yes. our children move in, yes. after that stage? Yes. Okay, it <laughs> when will come does it back. happen? Not soon enough, I'm hearing. <laughs> Not soon enough. Um, it usually starts around the end of middle school mm -hmm. and is worse in in high school. So worse. So worse. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, well, I won't get into it. It's just a funny story. But sort of like parents handle it in lots of different ways. College, it starts getting better. College can be a little harder when college students haven't done a good job integrating their friendship relationships and stories with their family mm -hmm. or family stories in conversations with their friends. Mm -hmm. So sometimes parents weekend or other events, college students can get very embarrassed. Yes. By their, um, um, but it starts to lessen. And then after college. 
They get embarrassed they, again? No, 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 no. It no. starts getting better. Oh, good. Um, and if parents can just sort of ignore the fact that their kids find them ridiculous and stupid and embarrassing and... Um, you mean I'm not really, really embarrassed? No, no Oh, okay. No, All right. Well, that's, no. that's good to know. Yeah. I don't have enough self yet to know. You know, that's what the young adult is saying. I don't have enough self yet. And so if anyone thinks I'm like you, I'll die. <laughs> You know, so once I have enough of myself, then yeah. you're free to be whoever you want, and I love you anyway. So it does come back. It does come back. It does come back. Well, I want to thank you so much very for joining us today here at the BCTV studio. Um, I want to thank BCTV. This is a labor of love that they do in partnership with the Brattleboro Retreat, and I'm very grateful for their support. I hope that you'll all join us again at Keep Talking a community dialogue about mental health and I and I'll look forward to seeing you once again thank you <laughs>